Hello, this is Michael Tracy, and this video is going to look at the compulsion for some people to lie to make their organization look good, and in particular, how this occurred with the 1960 Chinese Mount Everest expedition. Of course, there's nothing special about the Chinese expedition in terms of an official story being completely false. Currently in Britain, the Horizon Postal scandal shows all the same problems where people who pass as respectable individuals in society fabricated evidence and lied for decades for no other reason than to prevent the Royal Post from looking bad. This governmental groupthink resulted in hundreds of false prosecutions and led four of the falsely accused sub-postmasters to commit suicide. Thus, while Britain's shame over the Horizon Postal scandal is far greater than China's with respect to the 1960 expedition, this video is going to focus on the Chinese expedition. There are three major official accounts of the expedition. The first being the article published in the Himalayan Journal in 1961, written by Shi Chen Chung, the expedition leader who was not on the actual summit party. The second, an account written by Wang Fu Chao and Qu Yinghua, both of whom were on the summit party. And a final account appears in the book Mountaineering in China. When I first started making this video, it was going to highlight the various inconsistencies between these Chinese accounts. However, in reviewing the details of what happened, there is one thing that is consistent across all the versions, and that is that the summit party started with no water in high camp. In what can only be called irony, Chinese had their cooking equipment blown out of Camp 7, which was the Chinese high camp. The camp was initially placed here on May 4th in this location, which I will refer to as Camp 7 Alpha. The camp was not revisited until May 23rd when the final assault party reached there the night before the summit push. One of the Chinese newspapers describes the scene. But when they arrived at the assault camp, they found that only one of the two original tents was left. The pots and pans that had been transported here were all gone, and there was no way to cook or boil water. That was reported in a Chinese newspaper linked to the Wikipedia page. There is no remote possibility they made a 19-hour trek to the summit entirely without water. The lack of water is also confirmed in the initial account published in the Himalayan Journal, in which it is stated that they had no water the entire time, but no explanation was given as to why this was the case. Most commentators simply ignored the statement about no water as being just another piece of propaganda, such as them using the thoughts of Chairman Mao to reach the summit. However, the piece about no water turns out to be true, and that makes the part about reaching the summit using the thoughts of Chairman Mao no longer feasible. The loss of the cooker in their high camp explains many of the mysteries of the 1960 expedition. The first is why they moved the assault camp up to the base of the first step. It was initially at Camp 7 Alpha, but was moved up to Camp 7 Bravo in the nook at the base of the first step, which would be protected from the wind. The old location was too exposed, and they could not rely on even having their tents still be there when they got back. It also explains why the 13 people who reached the final assault camp None of them stayed to melt snow in support of the returning climbers. They had no way to melt snow. It also removes any mystery as to whether they made the summit. It is physically impossible for people to take 19 hours to reach the summit and do it entirely without water. In addition, there would be no reserves at high camp, so their next available water would not come until they descended to their Camp 6, and missing from every single one of the accounts is when exactly that took place. So if you truly believe that there is some possibility that a group of inexperienced climbers with no water, limited oxygen, climbing largely at night with no moon along an unknown route during weather which had caused the Indian team on the other side of the mountain to turn around and these people somehow reached the summit and returned alive, the numerous contradictions and mistakes in their various route descriptions and accounts will likely not convince you otherwise. As such, for the rest of this video, I will largely present a synthesis of the various accounts that outlines what most likely happened based on verifiable facts such as the weather, the time of sunrise and sunset, and the photographs taken by the Chinese team. All of this taken together paints a picture that they got above the second step, but they turned around somewhere below the false summit, which is where they probably collected the rock samples from. The day before the summit push, they arrived at Chinese Camp 7 Alpha, and they found that one of their tents had been blown away and they had lost all their cooking equipment. They then moved the final assault camp to the base of the first step in a location that was well shielded from the wind. However, as though there was no way to melt snow, the support climbers headed down. In one of the Chinese newspapers, another mystery is solved. Namely, why was the cameraman left in the assault camp when there was no way he could film the summit? 
The newspaper clarifies that the original plan was to have Qi and Hua only follow to the base of the second step and film the ascent of the second step, which would be easy enough to do as the 1960 team bypassed the first step. There would be no need for the cameraman to follow them above the second step, as their trek across the snow triangle could easily be filmed from below. May 24th being clear weather the entire day, with the wind picking up later in the day, as reported by the Indians climbing on the south side of the mountain that same day. The accounts then have them leave the assault camp at 7.30 a.m. for their summit bid, and that's 7.30 a.m. Mallory and Irvin time, and for this video I am adjusting all the time zones so that they use the same time zone used by Mallory and Irvin. The Himalayan Journal reports three hours to climb the crux of the second step, while Mountaineering in China, which provides more detailed climb time, states it took five hours with them reaching the top of the second step at 3 p.m. Mallory and Irvin time. Thus, according to the only account that reported the actual time at the top of the second step, it took seven and a half hours to climb from the base of the first step to the top of the second step. The commentary in the Himalayan Journal makes a similar calculation but arrives at seven hours using just a slightly different calculation. The accounts all differ regarding how the second step was climbed. One having Kyun Gin Hua remove his boots and socks and first attempt to scale the rock face directly, while others have him not remove the boots and socks until he decided to do the fireman ladder. In a rare personal account told by Kyu Yin Hua to John Clear, a mountain photographer who was climbing in Tibet, Kyu Yin Hua states they climbed the step exclusively by hammering pitons into the rock with no mention of using a fireman's ladder and standing on someone's shoulders. There are three different versions of the type of socks he was wearing, eider down, wool, and cotton, though perhaps he had multiple layers of socks. In the account in Detectives on Everest, it was stated that this was indeed the case, that he had multiple layers of socks, and he had left the final layer on with no explanation as to what the benefit of removing the other layer of socks was. The one detail missing from any of the official publications, but confirmed by subsequent expedition and Q's uh, personal account, is the hammering in of pitons to assist with the climb. Here I am referring to them as pitons, but they are really larger sort of ice screws that were hammered into the rock, thus they provided much more of a foothold than the pitons you would be familiar with. As subsequent expeditions found at least one piton in place, this was clearly done, but no official version reported it and the personal account of the person who climbed the second step has changed over time. This is a photo of the second step where you can see a modern piton hammered in to be used as an anchor. In Detectives on Everest, the account has Q taking an entire hour to hammer in the main piton. In the account told to John Clear, Q reports the following with no mention of the human ladder. The second step, said Chu, is a slightly impending rock wall about six meters high split with one big crack line. I managed to fight my way up it, he said, with my boots off by hammering ice screws into the rock crack and muscling up on them somehow. Thus, one of the mysteries of the scaling of the second step has been solved. Namely, simply standing on someone's shoulders would not be of significant enough help to scale the wall, and it would not explain why it took three hours to climb the obstacle, as they clearly had to have had thought about how they might attempt to do it prior to getting there. Instead, it took three hours to climb because of the time it took to drive the pitons in. It is unlikely a shoulder stand was used at all, as it would have been of little benefit, and if it were used, it was not the primary means they used to overcome the obstacle. The fact that the pitons were found in the rock by subsequent expeditions but missing entirely from any official account is a good indication they played an important role. More important is that carrying a hammer and pitons is not normal on Everest. They clearly had a plan to use them when they left base camp and did not simply come to the wall and mindlessly attempt to scale it, nor is it likely that only after repeated failures did they suddenly realize they happened to have brought a hammer and a bunch of pitons. The use of the pitons also explains why they never released any footage of them climbing the second step they had the camera with them, a clear sky and relatively calm wind. Footage of them doing a shoulder stand and scaling the wall would have played very well. Hammering in pitons and stepping up a bunch of metal spikes, not so much. Once above the second step, one of the climbers, Lou Lehman, was unable to continue and allegedly stays in place the entire night in the open without oxygen in a location somewhere close to the third step, and yet he manages to return alive without any frostbite. After leaving Lou at the third step, 
The next time that is reported is reaching the top of the false summit at 10 p.m. with two different versions of how they got to the top of the citadel. The top of the citadel is the false summit. However, just because the 10 p.m. time is reported, it does not mean it is accurate. The timing of their entire story is such that they only crossed the snow triangle when it was dark. The snow triangle is what John Knoll had his camera trained on in 1924 for Mallory and Irvin. And on May 24th, 1960, as reported by the Indians who were climbing on the other side of the mountain, the sky was clear the whole day. Thus, if the Chinese crossed the snow triangle at any time during daylight, they could have easily have been photographed from below. Thus, the Chinese have two problems. They need it to be night when they were on the summit to explain why they couldn't take any photos, but they also need it to be night when they were crossing the snowfield to explain why they were not photographed from below. Thus, while it took them allegedly three hours to climb the second step, it then took them eight hours to get to the false summit. And this is where the official stories disagree again. In the Himalayan Journal, the account is, after crossing the snow-covered slope to the east, they wound around to a rock slope in the north and continued their climb. In a later published account, written by Wang Fu Chao and, and Qu Yun Hua, they state they confronted a sheer icy cliff. We were forced to trudge along the northern slope and circle around the cliff westward towards the ridge in the northwest. That is describing the summit traverse, which is a route followed by the modern climbers. The problem is that the icy cliff shows up in another account in a different fashion. In mountaineering in China, they do not go around it. In the dimness of the night, Wang Fu Chao, Gan Pao, and Qiu Yinghua, who now had to take a rest after every step forward, came face to face with a solid ice slope one meter high and with a gradient 60 to 70 degrees. Gan Pao climbed first but slipped back. Wang Fu Chao and Qiu Yinghua then tried but without success. They were now so exhausted they had not the strength to dig their spikes into the ice. Wang Fu Chao leaned on the slope on his stomach, clutching the hands of the ice axe planted on the upper part of the slope. He exerted himself in a chin-up, and with the help of Qiu Hua and Gan Pao, pushed from below, managed to get to the top. It was midnight before the three got to the crown of the slope. This is clearly describing a direct route up the citadel. There is no icy slope on the summit traverse to the north, and they clearly indicated they reached the crown of the slope. From there, they would run out of oxygen and then climb to the summit. Once on the summit, all the official accounts agree that they placed a bust of Chairman Mao in some rocks nearby and took a sample of nine rock summit rocks. Later, one of the climbers would tell John Clear that the bust of Chairman Mao's story was not correct. Busts of Mao Tse Tung on the top, he said. <laughs> Rubbish, he said. We, we, we couldn't carry things like that up there. We were hard put to carry our oxygen. And yet, in 1975, the Chinese team reported finding the bust and recovering it. And even though they had numerous cameras with them on the summit in 1975, the one thing they did not film was the historic find of the bust of Chairman Mao, which is now on display in a museum, while the alleged summit rocks remain safely hidden away. The other thing they did not manage to film was the finding of the Chinese oxygen apparatuses, which they state they discarded at 8,830 meters, which is directly on the summit ridge and would also have been visible to the Americans in 1963, had the three sets of oxygen equipment actually been left there. But the main point with the bust story is that they were all in on it. The 1960 team, the 1975 team, they all knew they didn't make it. And yet they will all swear that a bust of Chairman Mao was buried in the rocks next to the summit. None of the official accounts provide any timeline for their descent and the stories told by the climbers themselves are too far-fetched to be realistic. The story in Detectives in Everest has Wang Fu Chao lose one of his boots on descent, and he simply replaces it with a mitten. The major accounts also differ in whether an earlier reconnaissance of the second step was performed. And then we get to the photographic evidence. This is the highest photo taken by the Chinese in 1960. And this is a similar picture taken by Hillary from the actual summit, with the mountain circled in red being the same in both photos. The Chinese claim this was from 8,700 meters, but it is clear from the photo it is nowhere close to where Hillary's photo was taken, the summit being at 8,848 meters, and thus 8,700 meters would not only be just slightly below the summit, it could not be that far away laterally. But the bigger problem for the Chinese is that 8,700 meters is right in the middle of the snow triangle. 
and there are no clouds in the vicinity of Everest in this photo. There would be no reason that photographers lower down the mountain could not have photographed the Chinese descending across the snowfield. Another problem is that the weather does not match up with what the Indians reported for May 25th. The Indians made two failed attempts on the summit. The second attempt intended to start from high camp on the south at 3.30 a.m. Mallory and Irvin time on May 25th. That's the same day the Chinese claimed to have reached the summit. However, the Indians reported violent winds that whole night and were not able to leave their tents until the winds calmed later in the morning. As the Chinese claimed to have been on the summit at 2.20 a.m. Mallory and Irvin time, they would have been descending in violent winds with no moon, no oxygen, no water, and no photos of them crossing the snowfield they claimed to have taken their photo from. The Indians turned around on May 25th with this report of the weather. There was no protection from the cruel wind and progress was slow. So strong was the wind and snow drift that Gonbao turned sideways after each step or two. Visibility was almost nil. As a note, there are two Gonbos uh, climbing up at that time, one on the Chinese team and one on the Indian team. Ultimately, the Indians turn around because of bad weather at approximately the same time the Chinese claim to have taken this photo. And while it is possible that conditions were abysmal on the south side route, while the Chinese photo does not show any severe weather conditions, it is also possible that the photo was taken on the 24th when the weather was calm, and this would mean the Chinese never spent a night in the open above the second step without oxygen. In sum, the admitted inability to melt snow in their high camp made any summit bid impossible. The conflicting accounts of the routes above the second step and a photo that was not taken at the altitude reported nor on the date reported, coupled with fanciful stories about placing the bust of Chairman Mao on the summit, leaves no possibility the Chinese reached the summit. More problematic is that it is not a close call, and any Western climber who claims they think they reached the actual summit has not looked closely at the facts. The primary reason people state they believe the Chinese is some alleged detailed description of the route when no such detailed description exists. One of the more popular blog entries on this issue is from Mark Horrell, and his analysis uses an account published in Peter Gilman's book Everest, 80 Years of Triumph and Tragedy, which is one of the three official accounts I referred to above. Horrell lists their description of scaling a one-meter rock as part of the proof, stating the third step is higher than this in total. It consists of a number of obstacles which could fit this description to an exhausted climber ascending in the dark. But let's look at what was actually written. In front of us at 8,700 meters, there was another ice and snow slope. We labored forward painstakingly in knee-deep snow. For every few steps, we had to halt to catch our breath. In scaling a one-meter rock in our way, all three of us slipped several times. It was almost midnight when we got through this stretch of snow. Midnight would be 10 p.m. Mallory and Irvin time. Nothing about that description would indicate they were actually on the mountain. Anyone who has seen photos knows that there is a large snowfield, but nowhere in that snowfield is there a three-foot rock that cannot simply be walked around. There is no place where climbers would encounter a three-foot rock and have three people not be able to climb it nor go around it easily. Horrell then states, they describe confronting a sheer ice cliff at the top of the slope and having to circle around it in a westward direction. This is exactly the route climbers follow today. And while it is the route climbers follow today, it is also the route Odell noted was a likely route to the summit, even though he did not get close to the summit. Horrell also ignored the contradictory account in Mountaineering in China, which has Wang Fu Chao do a pull-up to overcome the ice cliff. Horrell includes a photo from Mountaineering in China on his blog, so he clearly had a copy of the book, and it would not have taken long to read the one-page account of their summit bid and instantly spot that they were describing a completely different route. Horrell climbed the north side of Everest himself, so it is difficult to believe he didn't spot the problem with Wang Fu Chao stating he needed to do a pull-up on an ice cliff to get the top to the top of the crest, something that is not remotely necessary on the summit traverse. Nor is there any description of them traversing around that obstacle in the Mountaineering in China book. It is two entirely different routes. The Mountaineering in China account also states, with the help of the ice axes, they inched their way forward, and after summiting a huge rock, they were within five meters of the summit. The problem is, there is no large rock within five meters of the summit that you need to climb. It is a snow slope the last 40 meters. 
thus the Chinese accounts are only consistent if you ignore all the other inconsistent accounts and just focus on one of them, which is exactly what Horrell did. You can see this in Horrell's blog dealing with the second step where he states Lou Lehman made four attempts to free climb it, the second step, but kept falling. Qiu Yun Hua then took his crampon boots and thick woolen socks off to have a go, but also fell. And it is only after this that Lou comes up with the shoulder stand idea. But this is a different story than in mountaineering in China, which has all four of them making attempts and the boots don't come off until the shoulder stand. And of course, both no, make no mention of the pitons that were actually used. Horrell then states that although the description of the final summit ridge they provided is incorrect, it would match with someone climbing at night as nothing could be seen. But that would also apply to any peak being climbed at night without any moon. So rather than providing an analysis that shows the Chinese provided some detailed description of the route, Horrell's analysis is entirely making up excuses for why the Chinese description doesn't match with what the mountain actually looks like, with the only exception being their description of crossing the large snowfield that is visible to anyone who comes within 10 miles of Everest. And just as with Mallory and Irvin, there's a wealth of new information available that has come out in recent years. Any analysis that does not include the admitted lack of any cooker in their high camp cannot be considered reliable. With no cooker, a 19-hour climb to the summit, and 30-hour total climb without water is not believable, not even close to believable. The two different routes that are described in the different accounts, as well as admittedly lying about the statue of Chairman Mao, while the 1975 team claims to have found it at the summit, undermine any credibility of the climbers. What is left is a picture of what did happen. The climbers were able to use pitons and ice screws to get up the second step. They reached the area around the third step, as the rocks they collected are a lighter color consistent with the thrombolite layer in that region. They took a photograph at their high point and turned around as they had run out of oxygen, had no water, and the weather was deteriorating. They did not spend the night in the open, as the weather, as reported by the Indians, was too severe for them to have survived that night of May 24th in the open. There is simply no set of circumstances in which a group of inexperienced climbers with no oxygen, no water, and rapidly deteriorating weather can not only press onto the summit, not only return to their high camp, but return to two camps lower before they are met with assistance. The fact that one of the climbers had fraught spitten feet does not have any relevance as to whether they reached the summit. As he explained, he took his boots off to climb up the pitons he was hammering into the rock wall, and this fully accounts for why his feet were frostbitten. Of course, the Chinese can release the summit rocks to be subjected to legitimate analysis so it can be determined exactly how high they climbed. Photos of the rocks exist taken in the 60s, including a microscopic cross-section. As such, it is not feasible for them to swap out the rocks with recently collected samples. This is likely why the rocks will forever remain locked away in the Chinese archives. So 2024 will indeed be the year the history books need to be rewritten, or at least the Wikipedia pages. While the failure to search for summit rocks in 1999 means we are still not certain whether Mallory and Irvin reached the summit, even though the evidence is overwhelming that they did, we can be far more certain that the 1960 Chinese did not.